These impulse responses come from systems having the same poles. So how can they differ so much? To start, note the transfer function numerators differ. Let's generalize the transfer functions. They describe the response of a second order system. The left has a zero at s equals minus z. The right has no zero. Now we rephrase the question. How does the presence of a zero lead to such different responses? First, look at the second order system without the zero. Call it H1. The poles are assumed to be complex pairs, that is, the damping ratio is less than 1. Therefore, the denominator can be factored, and by partial fraction expansion, now, take the inverse Laplace transform. We obtain the time domain impulse response Y1 which is and reduces to note it's a product of an exponential and sinusoid the exponential governs the rate of decay or amplification the sinusoid governs frequency so we just determined the no zero impulse response now Determine the impulse response for the transfer function with a single zero at minus z. We call it h2. Factor as before, and by partial fraction expansion. Now, with the inverse Laplace transform, we obtain the impulse response y2 which simplifies. Here's where things get interesting. Look at the second term. Z minus A over B scales part of the frequency response. As Z approaches A, that term disappears. Specifically, as Z approaches, the real part of P, where the pole is at minus P. That term disappears. A second observation, the zero does not affect the rate of decay or amplification. From these observations, we now ask, how does the impulse response depend on the zero location? Here are the poles of the single zero transfer function h on the real imaginary plane. We obtained the impulse response, which we plot simultaneously as the zero location moves leftward. Clearly, a significant effect on the transient response. superimposing the responses for various zero locations. Now, recall the zero was initially in the right half plane. This causes the transient to dip down initially. As the zero moved leftward into the left half plane, the transient began to move up initially so we go back to the math to understand why. First, the impulse responses for our two cases. Now, expand the single zero response into three terms. Look what's in the single zero response. The original no zero term scaled by z. Again, look how this term affects the transient response where the zero moves from right to left half plane. 
the location of the zero is opposite the value of z, which is contained in this third term. With the zero in the right half plane, z is less than zero. So the third term is subtracted from the transient response. This is why the transient response undershoots more as z becomes more negative. This is also called a non-minimum phase response. With the zero in the left half plane, z is greater than zero, so the third term is added. This is why the transient response overshoots as z becomes larger. So in the single zero transient response, we have the original no zero response scaled by z and additional transient responses due to the zero. What is this additional transient response? Take the Laplace transform of each term and we find the transient is the derivative of the no-zero response. Note the transfer function h2 is now expressed as a function of h1. The effect of the zero is to scale the no-zero response and add to it the derivative of the no-zero response. Now consider how h2 behavior changes as z changes. As the magnitude of z gets large, the scaled no-zero response dominates. As z magnitude becomes small, the derivative of the no-zero response dominates. And in between these extremes, a2 is the combination of h1 and its derivative. So in the time domain for y2, we're looking at the linear combination of y1 and its derivative. Now, recall h1. Factor out h1 from h2. And note that h2 is the product of two transfer functions. h1 transforms the input u to its output y. The zero at s equals minus z transforms the output of h1 through the transfer function s plus z. The transfer function product is h2, the single zero transfer function, or the h2 output y2 over the input signal u. We now have come full circle from frequency domain to time domain and back. This allows us to understand the effect of the zero on the transient response from multiple perspectives. A final thought. Recall that filters act to reduce noise amplitude over a desired frequency range. This is accomplished with integration or strictly proper transfer functions. Here, the presence of a zero is in effect the opposite of a filter acting on the no zero output h1. That s plus z transfer function, as we have shown, scales the no zero response and adds its derivative, potentially superimposing large transient oscillation on the h1 or no zero response. We now understand how zeros can significantly affect the transient response of a transfer function. But the zeros do not affect the rate of decay or amplification of a signal. Instead, they appear as oscillation, overshoot, or undershoot. They are effectively transforming the no zero response. And this transformation involves at least one derivative of that no zero response. In the time domain, we see that the zero acts to scale coefficients governing components of the frequency response.
These coefficient values are a function of both pole and zero locations. And this is how zeros can interact with the location of poles to change the transient response. Access this lesson and more at learngnc.com.